follow your dreams, be yourself, um, enjoy life, live life, um, follow the rules, but be flexible to break them when it suits. Welcome to another episode of Bigger Than The Hustle. Now I've got my sixth international guest again from Australia. Her name is Crystal and she's got a really inspiring story. Um, She's created a lot. Um, She started her own travel agency um, back in 2013. And through her personal journey with cancer, she's also started a cancer-based charity. So those things I want to talk about and obviously more from there. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Crystal to introduce herself. So hi, Crystal. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Very well, Bambi. Thank you. Good, good. So I'm going to hand over the mic to you for the next 30 seconds. If you could just introduce yourself and how you come into the world, and then we can roll with the conversation from there. Okay. So my name is Crystal and um, my background is predominantly 30 years, I suppose, in tourism and hospitality. And uh, yeah, in 2014, I had a personal cancer journey that threw me into a very different world and one that I met so many amazing people, so many people that I thought were heroes. I heard so many sad stories. And, but what I found through that time was a lot of what I call service gaps. Really strange, I know, because people don't want to be a customer of cancer. But I found through my experience in the tourism and hospitality space that things could have certainly changed in a much better way, much better way. Hmm. Now, I see both your stories are intertwined there. So we talked about cancer, we talked about travel, and somehow you've tried to combine that. So not only are you trading some good out of the, the pain that you've suffered and the pain you've been through and your experience so that others, you know, can tread that the same path but a little bit lighter and a little bit easier and somehow yeah. with the experience you had, you can draw upon your own personal experience to, to provide a service. And I think it's fantastic when that happens. Now, something you mentioned which was quite interesting earlier, which was if someone goes through something like this, so, you know, during that time of going through cancer, that's quite a traumatic time, quite a painful time for you. But there's so many things that light up. So, you know, like you said, the conversations you had with people, the people you met through this journey, and it really opened your eyes to the positive that can occur from deep crisis and deep trauma. Now, that experience, can you talk a little bit about that and then what drew you to create the experience in terms of the travel agency based on that um, journey? Sure. So I remember getting the phone call, the dreaded phone call, to say there'd been some changes in the scan. My personal cancer was breast cancer and um, I'd been having regular mammograms, so all was good in that world. And then I got a phone call just to say there'd been a slight change from the, the one previously. Not to worry, these things happen a lot, no real need to worry about it, but we'd like you to come to the hospital to have some more tests. So I thought, okay then, so I just thought, it's just another hospital visit, you know, not a big deal. So I remember turning up to the hospital probably about 7.30 that morning, not knowing much at all as to to what the day lay ahead. And they just said, you may not even be there for an hour, we just don't know. So I said, okay. So I remember ringing a friend and saying, hey, I've got a whole day off work. How about I go to this thing? You come and pick me up later. We can go and have a girl's lunch, have a wine and have a good time. She's like, oh, yeah, great. So I got there and I remember walking in and there was just lines of white plastic chairs. Now, coming from a corporate kind of background, which I did at the time, I thought, okay, take a seat. I was on my own because... I didn't really think about whether I needed to take anyone. And I remember sitting there and all of a sudden the chairs all started to fill and there was like 30, 40, 50 people in this room and I was like, wow. And I thought surely with chairs lined up, someone will stand and address the crowd because that's what normally happens, but there was nothing. And then all of a sudden we sat there and sat there and sat there. A couple of hours passed and then I got called up and I went into this one room and they conducted a test and I said, oh, do I get to leave now? And they said, no, go back and sit in the waiting room. So I said, okay. So this went on for a while and it sounded like a chook pen. There was all these women chatting about all sorts of things, you know, and I thought, hmm, this is really strange. And, and then I thought, I don't think I'm going to get to lunch. Like it was getting up to lunchtime. I had nothing with me, no water, nothing. 
And I went up to them, I said, am I able to leave for lunch? And they said, no, you just have to wait until you get called back up again. So I went, okay. So it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, I think. And I remember looking around thinking, there doesn't seem to be too many people left here. I don't think this is looking so good. And I think by then I'd had maybe three tests. And then time went on, I got called back in and there was this one room I started to notice when there was less people in the room, the noises around me got a bit louder. And I heard this noise and it sounded like a, almost like a gun just going off consistently, you know, one after the other. And I was like, wow, that sounds a bit weird. Then next thing I got called in for test number five and they said, oh, we need to do a biopsy of your breast. And I was like, okay, whatever. I've had blood tests. I've had something else and whatever. And next thing, this thing, it was like a staple gun. And literally it was just slammed into my breast about four times. The pain was excruciating. The sound was horrific and there was no indication of what happens or what happens next. I remember walking back into the waiting room as numb as anything because, again, I was told just to sit and wait. And a lady behind me was called up next. I remember a lovely-looking lady, long, dark hair, and she walked into that same room and I heard this sound 14, 15 times I counted and I just put my head in my hand. She came out and I looked at her and she looked at me. We both had tears in our eyes and I thought, this is just not right. And I heard someone say, you have got to go back and change this. And I realised that that voice was mine in a very loud voice to literally only a few people left in the room. And I think I got to leave the hospital about 5.30 that day and they said it was inconclusive, but they felt that there was a 90% chance that I had cancer. So by that stage, I was numb. I hadn't eaten, I hadn't really drunk anything all day, completely mortified at the whole experience and just went into this weird old world. And then it was a couple of weeks later, or maybe a week later, I think, but I do remember one thing that was quite funny when they said to me, do you have a doctor in mind? if you need to have surgery. And I was like, who has the name of a doctor in their back pocket in case they need to have surgery for cancer? And I was like, no. <laughs> so anyway, that was that part. Um, but then, yes, we continued on. I remember it was Valentine's Day, 2014, when I walked into yet another waiting room to the doctor who then told me categorically, yes, I had cancer. And I walked back out into the waiting room and I saw a number of people all filling out the same form that I had to fill out. And it was just an experience that sits with me forever in all the waiting rooms that I sat in and the people I met. So it was through that, that uh, with the travel side of things, I wanted to somehow come back into this cancer world and change things for people. I wasn't sure how it was going to look or how you could possibly even do it, to be honest. So then um, I went and saw a business advisor because I sort of, you know, I had this dream and I had this, this passion that I had to move forward on this to do something. And I went and saw him and I told him my stories and, you know, some of the amazing people I met in the waiting room, some of the stories like people who live remotely from where I live about an hour, there was a bus that would bring people up to have their radiation treatment and drop them off at all the um, hospitals. And I started to think and I said, well, what happens to people that live more than an hour away. And those people told me, well, basically we have to move to Perth for the duration of our treatment. And I was like, really? And people who live remotely. And then I had people, particularly women, who even said, I'm taking a chance and I'm not going to take treatment because my children are too small and I can't leave them for six weeks. Those stories, honestly, it just, they sat with me and sat with me and I kept thinking, for a couple of years, something has to give. So I set up the travel business. It was what I knew. Um, I'd been made redundant from my previous role, so I needed something that kind of gave me a work-life balance because if I'd gone back into a full-time job again, whatever this thing was that I wanted to create, I knew it couldn't happen because I, I wouldn't physically have the strength, you know, to do that. So I thought if I do my own travel agency, I can do a work-life balance and I can start to explore whatever this other thing was going to look like. So I went and saw this advisor and I remember I had a laugh when I sat there and I said, um, I, I want to rebrand a travel agency. And he probably went, this is going to be the longest hour of my life. <laughs> so when I told him about what I wanted to do from the cancer perspective, he then said to me, you need to go and tell people your stories. 
And I thought, well, I can't really create a business about me. I'm just, just another person, really. And then I sat there and I said to him, I could start something about Blue Dot, though. And he said, what's Blue Dot? And I said, Blue Dot, it's the permanent tattoo you get when you have radiation treatment in the conventional way. And he said, I know a number of people that have had different cancers and had radiation. Would they have a blue dot? And I said, well, more than likely, yes. And he said, no one's ever really spoken about the blue dot. And I said, well, I've got to tell you, that blue dot changed my life. <laughs> because every day I got to look at this blue dot, as tiny as it is, this tattoo, to me it was like 10 foot wide, 10 feet big. It was just hated it. I spoke to this blue dot. I yelled at this blue dot. Every emotion that you can ever imagine would come out because of this blue dot. I had four viruses. I ended up with vertigo, slight loss of hearing, a lot of that because of that blue dot and because of the treatment that I had to undergo. And I remember saying to this blue dot, one day you're going to mean something to me. I don't know what, but you're going to mean something to me. So when I spoke about this blue dot, that's when he said, well, you actually need to start a second business, so to speak. And I was like, great. So off we went and we started to explore. And so in late 2018, I guess it was, I registered the name and went through some of the setup with that. And what I decided to do was obviously those waiting rooms, it was something so, to me, it was so important to go back and change the parts of the waiting rooms for people. So I set up Blue Dot with, with, I guess, three main sections is really how it works. And a lot of it really, when I think about it now, it's kind of based on a travel agency model. And I was like, that makes sense now with all my background of working for airlines and hotels and now having my own travel agency business. So the three main sections is this remoteness of people having to come to Perth and I heard of people sleeping in their cars because accommodation is too expensive and things like that. It's it just, honestly, you could write a book on the experiences of others. So I contacted one, uh, some people I knew in one particular hotel and I said, I need you to give me a deal like no other. I need a really good rate for people and I need to be able for you to agree that some people, if they qualify for that type of treatment, will be able to have chemotherapy in the comfort of a hotel room. So the hotel agreed with that, and that launched one part of our little part, which is called Blue Dot Hotels. And so what that means is people who live remotely, at least if they can come down to Perth, they can, you know, there is uh, some government assistance and potentially, you know, the out-of-pocket expenses are a lot less. They're not sitting in those waiting rooms, they're not having to worry about parking fees and all those stresses that comes we're sitting in a number of waiting rooms. And there was an organisation here in Perth that had started um, a few years before that, two nurses, an Australian first, and they set it up and it's called Chemo at Home. So as the name suggests, they go into people's homes and they deliver the chemotherapy treatment. So for us now, we have that option for people that they can have that in the comfort of a hotel room. So the language changes. They're not a patient in a hotel, they're a guest. So it's just some of those little differences, the point of differences, to change that experience. So my whole thing was about changing the experience for others. So we've also set up a, a fund, I suppose you could call it, and I wanted it to be so transparent that people know when they donate money where it goes to. We all know there's overheads and things like that to run any business or any organisation. But for people to really know that, their money that they donate, we are so grateful for. So the program we have is called Change 500. And our aim is to build 500 people to regularly donate 100 taxable dollars each year. And that sits in a separate, what I call a bank bucket. And when stories touch our heart, we activate that money and we support people. So a couple of stories. Last year, we had a mother who... Um, the children's hospital contacted me about a nine-year-old boy who was diagnosed with a brain tumour on mum's birthday. And they don't qualify for government assistance because they don't quite live far enough away. And they were worried about the remoteness of the travel and all the rest of it. So we looked, you know, to source accommodation for him. In the end, uh, he was quite critical. So he was treated as an inpatient. So accommodation didn't become a concern. 
Mum had separated from Dad and Mum also had three other children. So she was spending 24 hours in the hospital with her boy. Dad would come in and take over and she would then drive home 50 kilometres and then spend 24 hours with the other three kids. So this went on uninterrupted like that for 110 days straight. That was Mum's routine. And then finally with um, Riley, the young boy, he um, was allowed to go home just before Christmas and then he had to come back and commence his chemotherapy treatment. So we activated that Change 500 program and I went and I met Riley and Mum and caught up with them quite a few times. We gave them some petrol vouchers to help, took in some toys when Riley got through some of his fantastic milestones, which was great. And then um, I said to mum one day, right, I'm coming in to change your routine. And she said, well, I said, I only want you for a couple of hours because I understand it's important. And I went and picked her up from the hospital. I took her to have a half hour massage. I took her to have some lunch and then I took her to food bank to stock up her cupboards for Christmas. All done by that Change 500 program. She couldn't believe it. it was really something different for her. So what we do is we change that experience where we can for people. So if it is, if, you know, contributing towards accommodation, have a, had another man who came over during COVID last year and, uh, of course, he had to isolate and pay all those extra expenses. So when he went away and came back, we contributed to his accommodation during his treatment time. His change for that, I remember when he went to the airport, he said to me, this is not goodbye, this is the start of a new friendship. Now, for me, honestly, that was just like, it's absolutely what this is all about, where we can change things for people. And then the, the main uh, part, I guess, as well as one that we call is our concierge program. And what that is, is that's where we support people in whatever way they need. So when people are referred to us by um, some of these treatment providers, it could be that they want us to source some accommodation for them. It could be that they've never been to Perth. We have a leading edge um, cyber knife radiation over here now, there's one of its kind, it's here in Perth. Funnily enough, you don't need a blue dot for that. And I was like devastated. It was like, what do you mean you don't need a blue dot? But this robot is amazing. And I said, that's okay, we'll work with you on that. Um, but what happens with those people is very often, because the treatment is, is expensive, so very often they come on their own. And I'm like, you won't be sitting in the waiting room on your own. That just won't happen. So we... Uh, we'll concierge that, we sit, whether it's just sitting with them and talking about their family, their friends, you know, and sometimes there doesn't have to be a monetary component. And yesterday, um, we have a man down from Darwin who started his treatment yesterday and his daughter's come down with him. He was diagnosed with his cancer 12 months ago but didn't want to rush into treatment. He wanted to research and he came across this particular treatment that we have in Perth and, and decided to do that. He was very anxious. We picked him up. He was. He wanted to be there 30 minutes before. He said, they're always on time, always on time. So I said, fine. So he's sitting there. And, of course, for whatever reason, yesterday, they were running late, weren't they? 15 minutes. You could just tell the stress. So finally he went in. He started his treatment. And I said to the daughter, how do you feel? And she said, I don't know. And she said, 12 months ago when Dad told us, she said, we just said, we want him to get the cancer out. She's got to get out of his body straight away. And she said, so it's been a long journey. And she then just broke down into tears. And so, of course, we got the tissue box. We sat there. We talked about her journey and what it was like supporting her dad. Like she just said, I don't know what I'd do without my dad. She said, I can't imagine that. So it's such a humbling thing. And really when you look at it, it's based on the travel agent model because we, we research we source what their requirements are, we present the options to them and they choose whichever way they want to go. So we don't tell them what hotel they should stay in, we don't tell them. We ask, you know, some of the, um, you know, like if they have uh, one lady last week, she had spinal cancer, so therefore she was had a little bit of mobility issues. So it wasn't really cool to put her in a place that had steps because she'd struggled with that. So they're the sort of things that we ask them. So we've got this one, there might be a few steps here or there's that. How will you cope with that? And she's mm -hmm. like, fine. And to be honest, with most of the people so far that I've had, most of them I don't even know what cancer they have until they get here mm -hmm. because we don't focus on any particular cancer. Our tagline is we focus on the person 
not the disease. It's amazing. That just one, everything you've just talked about there, Crystal. Um, it's really been a journey for you and it continues. It seems like it's, 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 you know, when they say enjoy the journey, not the destination, and it seems like that's exactly what you're doing. You know, every day brings something new. Um, mm. You And because the services you offer are so bespoke in a way, there's nothing, there's never going to be a one box solution that fits all right. right? This blue dot now, this is quite interesting. I've never actually heard of this. So I don't, is this a worldwide thing or is this just Australia? Yeah, yeah well, I assume it's worldwide, yeah. Oh, okay. It's funny because when you, when you do talk about it, people will come up and say, I've got two blue dots or I've got three blue dots or oh. something and they get a little bit excited about it. I really, I, I've never, it's, you know, <laughs> when I've talked about this in the podcast before. There's, there's 0.1% of the things you know you know. The 0.1 things of the things you know you don't know. And then yep. there's 99.9% of the things you don't know you don't know. Yeah, and that exactly is right. <laughs> that, that's now moved bucket. So that's moved out and they don't know. Yeah. To the, I know I don't know. So that's yeah. really interesting. I, I did not realize that there was a way that you were identified or, or it was given to you. And do you know what the reason for that is? Um, why you're giving well, the reason um, that is because what happens is they they determine where the cancer is and obviously where they need to radiate. Okay. And the less or the closer they can get to the cancer spot, the less damage they do to other tissue and, and things around it. And right. probably many years ago, as soon as you said particularly breast cancer, then it was a straight mastectomy, whereas these days they can do a lot more um, you know, like they can do what they call a lumpectomy and so they can do breast reconstructions and all that sort of stuff, which is awesome. And so what happens is then they line you up in that very same spot every single day. Normally it's around, depending on the cancers, but around 36 to 38 general treatments of this. So you can imagine you're pretty well wiped and you go into the machine and a bit like a safe, you know, four to the left, 21 to the right, and they line it up with that tattoo, that blue dot. And that's right. what's significant. And some of the things, you know, I remember one time in the waiting room where a young child was wheeled out and they said, oh, we need to put him in before you. And I said, oh, what do you mean? And then I realised that they have to knock him out because he's so young he can't stay still. So you have to lay still once they line that up because the potential damage to other, you know, like I said, tissues or organs surrounding where the cancer is, it's important to, to be very still. So, yeah. Hmm. And so that blue dot was huge. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, obviously now that, that doesn't make sense. I, I thought when, when you explained it, it was just like a blue dot universal place that you put it, but now I understand no, it's yeah. that you need the treatment, right? Um, yeah. And in cancer is one of those things, you know, if we talk about the actual... Um, now, I read an article about this and you might be able to fill me in a little bit more because obviously you've been on this journey. Um, yeah. Now, the, the formal definition of a disease is something that's can spread so it's some that spreads but cancer does not right so if you have cancer you don't pass it to someone else so what's it classified as you know if you if you talk about it from you know i'm quite mindful in the way we discuss cancer because my my mum's yeah. older sister she passed away of throat and um, um uh, jaw yeah. she got um cancer in jaw and it spread to her throat and lungs etc so she passed away about 20 years ago so i am very mindful yeah. of that i am aware of how it really disrupts and devastates lives, especially for the people around them, especially if you don't get through it and, and, and you do yeah. suffer. But is it, what is it actually classified as when you talk about cancer? Because I know it's used, the word disease is used, but it's not essentially a de disease, is it, in the truest sense of the word? Yeah, no, I know, you're right. It, it is a bit is strange how, mm. how it is sort of classed as a disease. And, all, you know, mm. I mean, if you look at that, some people say it's dis-ease within yeah. your body. You know, so there's yeah. that, yeah, disease. So, yeah, it is strange. And, and, you know, I think these days as well, uh, cancer is just, it's just everywhere. It's, mm. it's crazy. And, um, but I think also we're detecting it early or finding it early. And um, like I said, for me, I was very lucky. It was found so early. And that was the one thing they did reiterate in the beginning was we have found this very early. This is a very good sign. Um, but, yeah, I don't really understand. And it, it, I guess they call it a disease because it can travel. So some people, like a lady um, last week, she was being treated for radiation to her brain and her spine 
and yet her original cancer was in the breast. Mm-hmm. So okay. it had spread. So maybe that's why yeah. they call it in, a disease because internal. in some cases, it, yeah, it can yeah, spread no. quite quickly. I, and, yeah, I understand that. So now yeah. let's let's rewind to the when you started your story about your um, your own personal phone call and and getting called in, etc. Now, if you could rewind back to that moment, okay. All the things that have happened, because it seems like there's a plethora of things that have happened since then that were, and you can pinpoint to that moment to say that was a moment that a lot of things started for me, both negative and positive, but it seems like you've somehow blanketed all the negativity with positivity, with all the things you've created and all the ways that you're trying to help and support other people that are going through this journey. Now, if you rewind to that moment and someone gave you this option to cancel that and say, you're not actually going to go through that crystal, we're going to give you a choice. Um, what would your choice be? To not go through the entire journey? No, to go not, not have the cancer in the first place. No. It was the best thing that ever so. happened to me. Yeah. It was the best thing. I, and you will never say that in the beginning and while you're going through it, and I get that, but truly I am so grateful for the experience I had because it is a world you can never understand yeah. unless you actually, and it's not about the cancer. That I guess that's the thing for me. It wasn't about the cancer. It was the people. That was the real thing for me was the people. Some amazing people that had horrific stories and yet they still would laugh and smile and their world was, yeah, they're incredible. So for mm. me it's about the people, yeah. And that is the light, isn't it? That's I, that's what I see as the light within the human, you know, the human within us, that you, we, we get surrounded by so much light that sometimes we don't see. Sometimes we, we get stuck in our own worlds and our own egos where we, we, we block this off. But when we actually take a step back and look around us and actually open our eyes and become aware of all the goodness that is being created or the goodness that continues to shine our way if we allow it if we if we take the sunglasses or we take the filters off and we allow that light to come in there is so much isn't there like and there's so much to be blessed with and there's so much we you know every morning if we wake up and just just even write down a few things that we are continuously grateful for absolutely you know that list can build up so quickly can't it in terms of what yeah. you know which yeah. ways we come into the world now Crystal, it seems like obviously you seem to be um, a solution orientated person. There seems to be always, you know, let's, let, I see a hurdle. Um, I'm going to get around it, under it, over it, or knock the thing out my way, but it's not going to be a hurdle for me. Okay. Where do you think that mindset comes from for you? Do you think it was generated from a younger age, or do you think you've created this from the experiences you've had over life? I think it was probably. I think there's probably a part of it like when you're younger, but I also think your focus is different when you're younger. You know, you probably want to be a bit of a career climber. You want to kind of change the world and do all those, whatever, leave your footprint. But I think when you have what I call a life-changing event, um, and that's really what it was, I had to sit, take stock. You know, I was going to work every day, coming home, you know, six, seven o'clock every night, doing all the things that I should have done. And... I remember someone saying to me, if I give you 10 seconds and I'm going to put you in front of 100 women who are about to undertake the same journey as you, what advice would you give them? And I went, oh, I've never thought about that. And they said, you've now got eight seconds. And I just went, learn to say no, put yourself first, follow your own advice. And I went, oh, my goodness, where did that come from? And I truly believe that that was probably a lifetime of things, you know, going through, particularly as a woman, I feel, we constantly, we we don't say no to something because we think, oh, that's going to upset so-and-so, so so we do whatever. We're always putting other people first, be it the kids, be it the dogs, be it everybody else, you know, and someone will tell you, you're constantly telling others what they should do, especially when you're sitting in that hairdressing chair, (laughs) you know, and you're having that, yes, we can tell you this and tell you that. And... I kind of start to try to use that as my little mantra now. So I think it is a journey that is with you all the way, but maybe once you've had that life-changing event, 
perhaps it really makes you take stock and stop and think. Hmm. Yeah. And I, from what you've just said there, I resonate deeply with that because my wife would agree with you wholeheartedly in terms of mm. what, you know, constantly women are putting themselves second to, like you yeah. said, you know, the kids, the situation, the circumstances, yeah. you know, whatever it is, rather than saying, you know, sometimes she'll say to me, you know, you can come in and just sit down and it's fine. Um, but I see this and I see that and I see that and yeah. I see this and, you know, all these yeah. things do. And I said, but that's a muscle that's built in me as well. Because sometimes when you yeah. have to say, you know, you sometimes you have to say no to others to say yes to yourself. Um, and I'm a bit better at that than you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it's true. Yeah, but I see the value in that. You know, I see if I'm strong, I can be strong for those around me, and I can right. give the best. In the I can be, shine my light bright, so they can take that light and take it into their world. You know. Yeah. And sometimes when you, I know I felt this way. Sometimes when you're depleted, you know, when you're tight, mentally exhausted, and physically exhausted, you're no good to anyone. Um, never mind yourself, but anyone around you either. So. There's always, you know, I think we're learning this more and more where you, unless you look after yourself, no one's really going to look after you and you really have to try and put yourself forward. But I do understand the struggle. I do understand the pain that a lot of people go yeah. through with that. And it is real. It is real. Now, if, when, when you set up your travel business, I know you under, I understand it came through your journey did was that ever a plan to move in the direction of setting up your own business whichever way that was or do you think that materialized based on what happened to you yeah it's a good question really because i don't know i think what it was was um because my cancer journey was 2013 and about and at the time i was managing i don't know maybe 60 65 staff and when I finished my radiation, it was about five weeks later that they called in and said, you know, the business decision has been made that you and your entire team are going to be made redundant and you need to manage that process. So I hadn't even really recovered with all that and I was going into this, you know, big setup. and that took probably about nine months. So to be honest, I didn't really have a lot of time to think about me. Somebody said, and what are you going to do? And I went, I don't know. But then I stopped to think and thought, this might be the opportunity that will come to start whatever it was that I need to go back into this cancer world. And that was when I thought, well, you don't just start something straight away. You obviously need to research things. I needed to get on top of my own health, you know, through obviously the cancer journey and then, of course, you know, this um, transition of the business. And so I sort of went into something I guess I was familiar with more so, which was the travel business. So with, you know, 14 years airline experience, seven years hotels experience, um, or 18 years was at airlines and customer service, I thought, what do you do with that and be able to have that work-life balance? So that was where I thought I'll go into the travel world. Oh, boy, I had a lot of learnings, let me tell you, because it was very different to what I was used to doing. So that took quite a while. And even to set up a business was completely new to me. So there was a whole pile of new learnings to do that and get this little business, you know, to do something. Um, and then it was a business of how do I get that to go in conjunction with the cancer world. So through the travel arm, I started to do a couple of retreats, you know, when we could do that thing called travel. Oh, <laughs> anyway, and um, <laughs> we started, I started taking some groups like to India to do some like Ayurvedic treatment, which i had had, which is just stunning. And so I built up with that. And so it became through that as well that the cancer came connected. I would, um, I guess, um, you know, reach out to people that had had cancer and just explain to them how wonderful I felt after allowing yourself to, you know, go on a retreat and actually not make decisions and do all those sorts of things. And so, you know, built up the last time we went, I think there was 15 of us and I actually had two people from the UK that came and joined us. Um, so that was part of it. And then I realised that that had sort of set where it was and that was where I thought, how do I go now into this complete cancer world? And so by now being in the, the travel side and the cancer stuff, we've got the hotels component, component which is really good. That's really important for me um, to have those relationships, to build something to offer people at a cheaper rate and nurturing them through that system. 
So they're now starting to really work well together. Yeah. yeah. And it seems like you've, you've, you've plugged things in as the needs arisen as opposed to hmm. seeing things before you, you started. And I think, you know, my journey was similar in terms of when I started my business, we offered just one, you know, I'm in home technology, so we do sort of technology for the home. And um, we offered it just um, a satellite uh, a system called Sky, which is like a local um, channel-based system. And we started with that and then everything grew from that and it's funny yeah. that we I talk to younger people now and I said you're not going to know what the journey holds for you until you walk through that door until you walk through that door you're you know in theory yeah. you say this is this 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 but the amount of times you walk through and I'm like you you look back and you'll you'll get to somewhere and you'll be like I didn't even see this I didn't even yeah. see this that, <laughs> that you know yeah. until yeah. you isn't that true that yeah. there's so many yeah. things so many ideas and, and this is why having a big plan really sometimes doesn't work so well because you can yeah. a plan is only based on the experience you've had not what's possible so it's like i've seen this so therefore that's the plan and this is why business plans always um i find them quite stifling because you say you you want to do this this and this but you don't actually know what's possible until you walk through and say, let's start walking, let's be open. And it's like when we talk about, um, um, you know, we talk about uh, destinations. So you say, oh, yeah, I want to get here, I want to get here. And as humans, what I've noticed, like, say, for example, you want to get to the top of a mountain and you're like, you see the mountain, this hour, you see business, you see the mountain, you're like, I'm gonna do. but then you realize you just have to start walking. You just have to start walking and then sort of get up there. And, and, if you if you actually just got your focus on the tip, so I want to get to the top of the mountain, you may miss those sights. You may miss those views that you can just stop for a night and just enjoy what you see because it just feels good. Because you're thinking, no, I just need to crack on. I just need to get out there. Yeah. And then what happens is what I found is that just as you're getting to the peak and just as it's in sight, you see the next peak. And, yeah. you, <laughs> and the whole yeah, yeah. thing, what you're trying to do you have always ignore that because like okay now i'm nearly there let me just work out yeah. the next thing to do because i think yeah. as humans you know we're always growing we're always thinking of the next thing yeah. that we we almost stop we forget to stop to actually enjoy that you know look back and say look at what i've done look at what we you know where i've come from and where i've nearly reached and when i reach it let me just enjoy it for a moment before i get my backpack on and, and move on so in, in that respect, what kind of things have happened to you? And when you look back, you think, first of all, I didn't even know that was possible for me to create that. But also going forward with the limited experience and knowledge you have, what do you think is possible coming up for you? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? Because you just, to me, um, I mean, I remember when I was sitting there talking about, um, you know, Blue Dot and, and explaining um, the story and there was a girl at the time she was only about 21 a friend's daughter and she said well who's going to do your website I don't know she goes well I'll do it and I was like oh sweet and she said so you know what about a logo and I was like mm, I don't know and I said but I don't want anything corporate she said what do you mean she said, what's corporate and I said I don't know isn't that a word you know like and I said you know in, the, in my travel business for everyone to reach out to me I have to be a director or an owner you know, and I'm like, who wants that? And I said, well, if you do that and you do the social stuff, maybe. I said, I wanted to choose a butterfly. Butterfly is a symbol. And, uh, you know, someone once said to me, everyone uses a butterfly. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to use a butterfly because to me, the butterfly means change, endurance, hope, life. It's a, it's a massive symbol. It's all those things you need on a cancer journey. And... So I said, well, if you do the social stuff, I said, you could be our social butterfly. And then I said, we could have event people and they can be an event butterfly. And then I said, well, where does that leave me? And I went, Madam Butterfly. And she said, oh, and someone said, oh, sounds a bit prostitute doesn't it? And I was like, oh, do you think? I was like, oh, that's exciting. So anyway, my title is Madam Butterfly because I actually don't care about the title. Like, you know, seriously. So my business card, people look at it and they go, Madam Butterfly, <laughs> I think, well, oh, that's what it is. So my thing is have fun along the way. Who knows what, like you say, what's going to come out of this, um, where it goes to next. And for me, even though I, I remember uh, one of my board members, I hand chose the board members, and one of them is a customer experience designer. Strange thing to have on a board, I guess, but 
um, and you don't want to be a customer of cancer, but she understands the customer experience journey. So I was interviewed formally by a couple of board members to talk about my story. I revealed a part of my story that I'd only just opened up to people not so long about. Uh, I wasn't, um, what's the word, certainly not um, proud of the time of what happened to me, but basically I didn't really cry or get upset when I was diagnosed and so many things happened and, you know, same thing, you put everyone first. But this one particular time I came home and I remember the facade went up and I opened up the letter, I had a letter and the bank, it was a letter from the bank saying I'd overdrawn on my mortgage and I was like, well, that can't be right. So I jumped online, of course, everything came up red, all the bank accounts, everything, and I was like, oh, my God. I literally, I literally, literally did not have a cent to my name. I'd overdrawn on everything. And that, the reason I did that was because I wanted to be well with this whole journey that I had to do this nine-month transition of business. Tap, go, tap, go, tap, go with credit cards and everything. You know, I'd have massages, Reiki, you name it, anything to make me feel and look better to keep my resilience and resources up. So I lied to one of my sisters and said, oh, you know, I'm in a bit of, um, you know, trouble. They forgot to pay me and something, something. So I did all that. And, and as a, a bonus to me for going through my journey, I'd already booked myself to go up to Broome and have a little holiday. And I got up to Broome and I remember um, when I when I realised this thing, I just, I literally fell apart. I shed a whole sea of tears about, I couldn't believe that someone who was technically a strong woman could lose control of, of of everything and I was so embarrassed I wouldn't tell anyone and then I had a bit of a thought and I thought I think I've got some frequent flyer points so I actually jumped on and I converted them to vouchers for the local store which also had one in Broome and I took those vouchers to Broome and that's what I actually had my holiday with I bought food I took a lot of food from home and I sat there thinking it was like a war and it was it was a personal war for me with what I'd gone through and lost complete control. And yeah, like I said, was not, um, you know, proud at the moment, but it happened and it's real. And so when I started to share that story with some friends and everything as well, they were like, well, you know, where to next? And so for me, it was like, others will go through that. And I'm quite open to have those stories with people to say, this is what happened to me. You may not be going through that, but you might be going through something similar. And it's then that they might talk about some of those other struggles that are happening around the cancer journey, be it for them or be it for one of their loved ones. And so for me, it's those things that are changing it constantly, which is where that concierge program developed and has blossomed by sitting with people in a waiting room and just letting them, letting them feel the moment, I guess, you know. So, but where to next? Well, I've got a little idea <laughs> and I'm wondering, once we sort of get through some of these next exciting stages, who knows, maybe we bring in pets mm. because pets get cancer as well. Yeah. yeah we'll yeah. see. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and ca pets are a part of the family as well, right? Um, a huge amount. You know, and that's, you know, if we, we, we care for the animal kingdom, like we've ravaged it as human beings, um, I think it's just our duty if we can care for them the same way yeah. we care for each other. Um, I think it's, it's a really important message. So and as you said, getting to the end, you know, like you've got to have the fun along the way. Yeah. Like we sit with board members and we laugh, we do some silly things, we practice marketing and we don't really know it. And I said to him, but it doesn't matter. So when you see our posts, it might be that something's half cut off and it's, you know, like, do I really mind? People don't mind because they know it's coming from us, you know, so it's genuine. I haven't got someone externally doing it. It's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Having fun where we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's and I think that's what makes the journey even more exciting because you're like, you know, sometimes life we can feel gets quite heavy, um, and like you said, you've been through that time, and I don't think you want to go through that time again where life is on your shoulders and just by lighting the mood and it's not that serious is it really in the grand scheme of things if you go far enough ahead you know 10 years time oh i got that poster wrong does it really matter <laughs> no it doesn't so, you know yeah, that's true right I've done a few of those, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> now what i'm going to do is I'm, I'm even though the mood's been heavy and light i'm going to lighten a little bit we're going to do a, a 10 qu quick fire question round okay now what i want you to do 
Yes. Crystal is I'm gonna ask you 10 random questions okay yes. they're nothing to do with anything apart from just whatever comes out of your mouth at first so you Good can have a moment, to think, a moment to think and just come out with it even if it doesn't make sense just come wow. out with it. it'll be more fun wow. can I apologize in advance yeah. <laughs> 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 <No. laughs> that's fine so um like I said 10 quick, 10 quick five questions don't think too much let's just get some answers out there right okay, okay. Go. If you won a million dollars, what would you buy? Wow, if I won a million dollars, what would I buy so I can't pay something off? No. Do I have to buy something new? Yeah. You have to, no, no, just buy it, it's just something. I'll go buy something. Okay. It doesn't have to be for uh, yourself as well, it can be just something you buy. Oh, so I can't be self-centered, okay. Um, no, you can be. <laughs> oh, you can be. <laughs> yeah, you know what, I'd probably get myself a new car and then yeah. I would, um, Take the family, rest of the big family, extended family on a holiday. Perfect. When the board what? is open. <laughs> yeah, when you're allowed. When yeah, you're allowed. Yeah, when we're allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> what is one food you want to wouldn't want to give up? One food I wouldn't want to give up. Butter chicken. What is your best feature? My hair. What is your lifelong dream? To have fun. When I dance, I look like? Oh my goodness, I'd love to say Fred Astaire. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't say that. When I dance, I look like someone who doesn't know how to dance. <laughs> <laughs> if you could get a yacht, what would you call it? Sail away. On a scale of one to ten, how cool are you? Uh, eight. If you were stranded on a tropical island, what two things would you want with you? Hugh Jackman and Hugh Jackman. <laughs> okay, so this, this, this may answer the next question. If you were on a plane that was about to crash, who would you want sitting next to you? It wouldn't be Hugh Jackman, would it? No, because he'd already be on the island. Uh, who do I want? No one. No. And if you could write a book about your life, what would it be called? Living the dream. Brilliant. There you go. That's <laughs> 10 questions. I don't know whether any of those made sense, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of people always say that didn't seem like 10 that seemed like seven that but that was 10 questions oh was it oh, okay <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> right so crystal um just as we head over to the end of the podcast there's a couple of more questions i'd like to ask you um oh. something to get the listeners to understand a little bit deeper about how you think and what your you know what your values are so yeah. we're going to Fast forward 100 years into the future when you're at the last moments of your life. Now, you don't have enough energy to speak, but you have enough energy to share three words. Now, these three words have been have resonated with you all your life, um, and you hope by sharing them, you could help others that are listening today. What would those three words be for you and why? Follow your dreams. And the reason I say that is... We often we have people who, if we are succeeding in whatever that looks like for us, often people like to see that not work for you and they put you down. So I just think if you really believe in something, go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't let anyone tell you what your dream should be. Only you know that, yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. So uh, this podcast is called Bigger Than The Hustle and right now you're bigger than the world. So I've got this uh, mic and it's connected to 7.58 billion people on this planet. You, they can all hear you. They're all awake. There's no language barrier. They're all conscious and they're all listening to what you've got to say. If I hand this over to you for the next 30 seconds, what would your message be to the world? Follow your dreams. Be yourself. Um, enjoy life live life, um, follow the rules, but be flexible to break them when it suits and if it's in the right manner. Um, have fun, laugh loud, 
and often. Perfect. Now, at this juncture, Crystal, I'd really like to thank you. Thank you for and, and honor you with for your authenticity today. Um, the message you've shared. I've always said that when time goes so quickly, um, I've I've enjoyed the, the the conversation, and I hope you have too. And I hope we've got something that we can share and throw that light out into the world. I love the way that you come into the world. I love the way that you think. The way you 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 seem to be so positive all the time with you know whatever life throws at you. And I've always said you know the the universe always gives the hardest lessons to those who, who can handle it and can take it and turn it into something, you know, um, turn lemons into lemonade. And, um, and I can see that you're doing that on a, a daily basis. So thank you. Thank you so much again for sh- giving up your time and sharing your, your wisdom, sharing your journey and uh, sharing your positivity and your awesome, awesome light <laughs> into the world. Because we, you know, if the whole world was filled with crystals, we'd be, you know, shining like a crystal. I know that's a bit of a cheesy analogy. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I, think, okay. yep. I think it really works. So just yep. just before we go, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, well, thank you to you. And I, I just think, isn't it amazing that um, in this crazy world that we've been sort of living in in um, the last 12 months or so, that here we are in opposite ends of the planet and we can still connect, we can reach out to each other, we can talk, and I hope, like you say, for your listeners, that that they feel the same, that there is, all of us are in, you know, that same silly boat at the moment, Um, but I do believe there's just something good to come out of it for everyone. We just have to, you know, stay focused, stay on whatever path we're on, and um, look forward to better times here. Mm -hmm. And I think what what the the biggest... I think the biggest help for me has been is the ability to slow down. I think we were all on a on a wheel at some point before the whole lockdown where we were yeah. running so fast and I think we didn't even know why we were doing it a lot of the time. No, no. You know, we'd gone into autopilot and it just gave you know, when, when someone said stop. Yep. It that I think it was needed for so many people and it allows you to then reflect and actually say is this how I want my life to be or do I want to change it any other way? And, and this is the ideal time because we didn't really have anything else to do apart from yeah. do this. You know? yeah. And I think so, also it's made us realise the material things just oh, yeah. aren't that important anymore. No. You know, like it's all about minimalistic and it's about people and connections and, yeah, just, mm. you know, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So thank you, thank you so much again. Now, I am your host, Bhavik Patel, of the podcast Bigger Than The Hustle. And right now, just before we go, I'd like to leave you with a few few thoughts. Big energy leads to big thoughts. Big thoughts lead to big ideas. Big ideas lead to big actions. And big actions lead to a big life. So keep thinking big. Until next week, goodbye. You know, you asked, the only thing you asked me before this podcast is to be willing to be my vulnerable and authentic self. Okay. I'm like, yeah, I can do that, no problems. But you asked me the questions that held me to account to being that vulnerable and authentic self. So thank you. I was, uh, I've got this really good vibe right now, feeling right now. I'm like, I'm like... <laughs>